Good afternoon and welcome to Acting Muslim, representing our authentic stories, the last of three special symposium events in a series called Changing the Muslim Narrative. I'm Faiz Ahirji, an Associate Professor of Communication Studies and Media Arts at McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario, and I'm so pleased to introduce this timely event and our speakers today. Before I proceed with introductions, I want to acknowledge that although we are meeting virtually today, and I thank all of you for being here, Many of us are speaking, watching, and listening on lands that belong to Indigenous peoples, and we gratefully acknowledge the privilege and the responsibility of living, working, and learning on these territories. All of the events in this series have been made possible through our generous sponsors, the Bell Fund and Creative Saskatchewan. The previous events, Muslim Women in the Writer's Room and Muslim Women Behind the Lens, were recorded, and you can find those videos on zarkanavaz.com. These events are being brought to us thanks to the actor and writer Zarka Nawaz and her team. Zarka is best known to many of us for her creation of the groundbreaking series, Little Mosque on the Prairie, which premiered in 2007 to record ratings on CBC television, paving the way for more diverse offerings on Canadian TV. Zarka is the author of a best-selling memoir, Laughing All the Way to the Mosque. Her novel, Jamila Green Ruins Everything, is now available. And her CBC Gem web series, Zarka, premiered uh, earlier this month, and I encourage you to check that out. For those of you in Canada, you can access those episodes for free by downloading the CBC Gem app, or you can view them on your browser. My own work looks at the representation of race and religion in the media, particularly with regard to Islam and South Asians. And I'm impressed by the way that Zarka subverts so many of the audience's expectations. Uh, using a divorcee's revenge fantasy to bring in commentary on settler privilege, unreasonable expectations for South Asian women and for their relationships, racial and economic hierarchies, ageism, Islamophobia, similarities among religions, and perceptions of women who fight for what they want. It both is and isn't a long way from Little Mosque on the Prairie, and I think it says a lot about how far we've come that we can have some of these discussions on screen. Mm -hmm. On that note, I'm sure that our speakers today have plenty of thoughts on the challenges of presenting quality entertainment that pushes boundaries, but before we hear from them, I'll just offer some brief highlights from their very impressive resumes. Bilal Baig is a Canadian writer and actor. Baig is the co-creator, co-writer, and star of Sort Of, a CBC television comedy series centering on a gender-fluid character. Baig is the first queer South Asian Muslim actor to lead a Canadian primetime television series. The series premiered on CBC in 2021. Their play, Acha Bacha, staged in 2018, centers on a non-binary Pakistani Canadian person struggling to reconcile their gender with their Muslim upbringing. Aidan Ababa is a multidisciplinary talent who pursues art as a means, not an end. A writer, showrunner, and producer, she undertook her first foray in film and television in 2018 when she wrote and produced a concept trailer that followed four 20-something 20-something-year-old East African women in Toronto awkwardly navigating adulthood as millennials and love and relationship as virgins. In 2019, she went on to secure a development deal with CBC for the series appropriately titled Virgins. That show is now set to release this fall, uh, so fall of 2022 on CBC Gem. And finally, Trevina Springer is an actress and comedian based in Los Angeles, California. This year, Trevina will join the Marvel Universe, appearing in Disney Plus and Marvel Studios' highly anticipated brand new series, Ms. Marvel. Additional credits for Trevina include CBS's Life in Pieces, Paramount Plus' Strange Angel, and the Clint Eastwood helm feature film, The Mule. In comedy, Trevina was a performer in the 2017 CBS Diversity Sketch Comedy Showcase, and her stand-up was featured on the reboot of BET's Comic View. All of these projects sound amazing, and I hope that everyone will take the time to check them out. And now I'm sure that you want to hear directly from the speakers, so I'll turn it over to them. Thank you so much for that introduction, Faiza. I wanted to just thank everyone for joining us today. Um, in many ways, all three of you are pioneers in representing Muslims on film and television. And I wanted to tell everyone, when I first pre-interviewed Aiden, I was actually really embarrassed when I said to Aiden, <laughs> you know, can we talk about um, stereotypes in the Somali community? And you said to me, what stereotypes? There are no Somalis in, in, in television. The last Somali we saw was on that Tom Hanks pirate film. And I actually had to look it up and it was called Captain Phillips. And I didn't even realize that. Can you talk to me a bit about like cr creating the first East African black women on television that like they have never been portrayed like this before? Yeah, it's really exciting. I've never seen a show that uh, had people that look like me, people with the cultural nuances that represent both myself and 
um, communities that are culturally adjacent. So we have Ethiopian, an Eritrean, a Somali, and a Sudanese character, and they are the, the foursome girlfriend group. And it's just so nice to have representation that doesn't show us, show any of us as criminals, <laughs> as uh, social deviants. Maybe we're just, you know, some young flirty women who are having fun, uh, learning about themselves, self-discovery and exploration. And maybe they're also virgins and there's nothing wrong with that either. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's really exciting. Thank you so much for that. Trevina, when, and, and when I was talking to you, it also never occurred to me that the South Asian Muslim has been the dominant Muslim on television and film, and that the Black Muslim, there's been an erasure. And it's so horrifying for me to say that, but I didn't even notice that. And then mm -hmm. and now we're starting to see more Black Muslims on television. Can you talk to me just about what does that feel like for you? Uh, it feels really huge. I think it, it's an excellent point to make that you know, a lot of the uh, representation of Muslims on television and film even when they're not good, it's usually Arab and South Asian. So the fact that we're beginning to see imagery of Black Muslims, especially in America, which make a huge population here, um, it's exciting. I feel very, very honored to be able to um, be one of the first characters, I think, that's been created on a stage like this that's really layered. And um, I think it's timely. It's sad that it's finally happening, but um, it feels really special. Black Muslims make up a huge population uh, in America uh, globally. And the fact that a lot of people are even surprised to hear that about the numbers of Black Muslims. Like, people are even surprised that I'm Muslim. <laughs> like I don't look at all like what people expect Muslims to look like. So um, it's timely and special. And I'm just thrilled that it's finally happening. Thank you for that. Well, you mentioned in an interview that you didn't want the focus of sort of to be about queerness. You wanted it to be about life. You, you were quoted as, I felt the responsibility to honor the character as truthfully as possible. We are never going to watch Sabi agonize over gender identity, over their sexuality, over their brownness. They are going to exist with all these things at once. Can you talk to me about that? Um, you know, I, I think it's, I just... I'm echoing everything that has already kind of been said on this panel so far. And so it's a really nice space to to be in because so often I feel like I'm offering a perspective that's that's kind of opening other people's worlds, but it's really juicy for me to kind of just take in what what um, everyone here is saying. So thank you. Um, I Yeah, I mean, it's just more of the same. I just wanted real. I, I was like, I, I, I have a lot of friends who look like, you know, people that we haven't quite yet seen on on TV. And we talk a lot about why we don't care or watch anything, basically. And and I think that, that when we were starting to work on what sort of eventually became it, that their, their voices, the voices of this really special community of like trans and non-binary and queer and black and brown, indigenous people that are like just um, circling my worlds, I... I I it a lot of their voices were just present in my head when when we were um, discovering what all, all that sort of could be and I think it's just about um, it it matters to approach work with like groundedness and integrity I think and and an openness and an, and as much awareness as possible and um, uh, I I think there's just more content like that now and I'm I'm really mm -hmm. grateful because feel like I'm finally actually watching TV. And for many years, I, I wasn't. Exactly. Like all three of you have such an interesting intersectionality with your work. And I wanted to talk to you, Aiden, you have four women who are coming from four different cultural backgrounds, Etrian, Ethiopian, Sudanese, Somali. Like, mm -hmm. how did you balance that? Like, like the different <laughs> identities, like that's incredible. Uh, I mean, yeah, it's it's honestly the juiciest part for me. Growing up, I've always loved uh, seeing and learning about different cultures and watching. I watched a lot of Bollywood. My mom grew up on a lot of Bollywood back home in Ethiopia. Um, and to me, it's just so like it's so juicy to eat with your eyes, you know, both the colors and the vibrancy, but also 
um, the intentionality of relationships with family and the very um, cultural specificity that exists in how things are handled and conversations are had and expectations um, within these cultures. And so for me, because I grew up in a culturally conservative community, um, my peers and my friends were also of similar communities and they were of all of these cultural backgrounds. They were Muslim, they were Christian, they were, you know, of all the different spectrums. And I, I think people don't realize how interconnected these communities are, how how close knit we, we are with each other. Um, so for me, it just felt really natural. It didn't feel like a, like a, a research mission that I had to do a lot of deep digging for it. If I was really mining from my own experiences growing up with my community and my adjacent communities that fe also feel like home. I know that what struck me in your trailer as a, as a Muslim woman, when I saw the, one of the characters and she's walking with her boyfriend and then they see the aunties, the Somali aunties, and they meet, and she immediately jumps down <laughs> and they, and he, and he's like, are we really doing this? And they're literally crawling away. It's like, yeah. How did you know? How did you know that? <laughs> because I'm her. Like, we're all her. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We've mm -hmm. all been there. Um, and I, I think that there's just so much, like, rich humor that exists in our existence, the, the straddling of multiple cultural spheres that people don't ever have to think about. Other people might not ever have to consider doing. Um, so there's the idea that I am you know, 20 something person, I have agency, and I'm independent, and I, you know, la la la, educate, whatever, you know, and then all of a sudden, you see your auntie, the all seeing aunties that like <laughs> exist all over the streets. And all that goes out the window, you are now on your hands and knees on the <laughs> ground, crawling away. Um, yeah, so both can be true. I just think it's all important. Yeah. Um, Trevina, I was watching some of your stand-up and mm -hmm. what struck me speaking of aunties and, and, you know, parents was that you, yeah. you are a convert to Islam and you talk mm -hmm. about telling your parents. Yeah. That was simple. I was like, can you tell me what it was like being a black woman in America, having to tell your parents I'm becoming Muslim? Like what was yeah. that like? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, took my time. It's really interesting. I took my time and decided to um, embrace Islam later in life. And it's one of the best decisions that I could have made. And I never would have thought that I would have been that person either. Like if someone described me as religious, I'd be like, that's absolutely not me. But um, I just found a lot of beauty in it. And so I'm very close to my family. So I had to tell them. <laughs> so <laughs> I um, took them to Olive Garden. It's, uh, you know, this, Italian chain restaurant and I was like everybody loves the breadsticks here so this will be a nice safe space to come out to my family and I uh was like mom and dad I forgot to tell you and, uh yeah I told them that I converted to Islam and luckily for me they're very accepting uh about it my dad had some jokes but it was really lovely you know um I think it's interesting that I made the choice to become Muslim as a, you know, a black woman, I'm already marginalized enough. It's like, let's join another group. But and this it, one uh, what'd you say? I said, and then to join another marginalized group like Muslims. <laughs> I know. I was like, this is good. Yeah. You know, when, when the Boston marathon bombing happened, my dad called me and he was like, do you mean, did you hear about what happened in Boston? I was like, no, what happened? He's like, there's a bombing at the marathon. I was like, that's terrible. He's like, do you know anything about this? That's like, <laughs> occasionally so when anything happens in the news, he's like, uh, you might want to just lay off. He's, he's worried about me. But um, they they eventually came to visit me and they went to a mosque and joined for Jummah prayer. It was really beautiful. I'm very, very fortunate. I have really great family around that. <laughs> Thank you. Bilal, you, you, you said this incredible thing in this article and it really caught me. You said, I'm really hungry to figure out how to continue to uplift, uplift other voices because if I start to feel like I've become the one person who needs to keep speaking about the non-binary brown experience, the pressure mm. becomes unbearable. Can you talk about mm. that pressure? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think we, I, you know, I've heard um, other artists talk about uh, feeling like they have to be that one voice that speaks to all things super correctly and, and responsibly. And, you know, I, I, I just see it as a really layered issue because I, I also think I'm allowed, I'm open to being accountable for when we do slip up and in, in our mm. pursuit to tell stories honestly. And, and I, 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 you know, I think sometimes the conversation feels like that, that single artist who's, who could be South Asian or non-binary trans is, is using, could, could kind of block themselves from, from critique by saying it's too hard to kind of do everything on my own and do it correctly. And, um, and, and so I'm trying to look at it like I, I, I'm, I'm creating from, you know, my brain and my heart and I'm working with lots of different people on, on this project in particular. And still we're, we're curious about continuing to, to learn on this journey. And I think the only way we can kind of really make some progress is by making space, like making a lot of space and, and hearing from different people. And on our show, we, and, and we, we, we've, we're working on our second season now, but we've worked with so many South Asian writers now, Muslim writers, queer, trans, non-binary people. Like our room every year is, is looking a little different in, in the writing. And um, it, that's fun and and curious. And um, I, I'm, I'm also really excited about thinking about uh, uh, crew as well. Like the, cause the set is so... It, the energy is specific and I, mm -hmm. I want to try to feel as safe as possible. And this year we implemented a program with where five trans non-binary um, um, young folks are training alongside the production happening. And so I get to see these five like emerging artists on our sets, like figuring shit out and they may continue to do this work or they may totally back out. And I just, I, I think it's, if we don't try, nothing's going to happen, you know? So why don't we try? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Aiden, I wanted to talk to you about virginity. It was so interesting um, on Little Mosque in the Prairie when I would talk about virginity. Like, it was not a big deal to be a virgin. I was a virgin. I married a virgin. It's, you know, there was no weirdness about it. But then when I got to the room and I was talking to some of the white writers, it was like obvious that oh, virgin, like it was a curse and something to get rid of and something horrifying. And like, no, 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 your, your husband liked you. That wasn't even humanly possible. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Right. And so when you talk about, when you called it uh, virgins and you said like, it's a very different cultural understanding of, uh, with other groups of people that I don't think the West has. Can you talk to mm. me about that? Yeah. Um, well, first and foremost, I named the show Virgins because when I would tell people about the show, they would whisper that last word. They, it was like shameful and secret. Um, and I wanted people to have to say the word out loud. And I put an exclamation point at the end to really say it. Mm. Um, and so we, there's, there's no shame in virginity. There's no, there's no, <laughs> it's weird that in the West we have to we feel like we have to tell people there's no shame in it. Whereas in so many other Eastern cultures and more culturally conservative cultures, that is the thing that you have the most pride in. And so I say with the show that um, these girls are, or yeah, these girls are too provocative for their, the homes that they come from and too conservative for the streets of Toronto. And it's challenge. Like I grew up straddling those two spheres and it was really complicated because when I would be with you know my family and my community I I was a rebel I was a very provocative and then when I would be with my friends from school I was way too conservative for, for anybody nope and um what's this in between place so there is I mean it sounds silly to even have to say but we're all virgin, like where everybody was born a virgin. We've all been a virgin. We come to the world a virgin. There's no shame in saying the word virgin. <laughs> Being virgin, it's normal. Yeah, it's very normal. <laughs> <laughs> Trevina, can you, people are so excited. Miss Marvel, like the first Muslim <laughs> superhero show, the Muslim character, and and you are. I know you can't talk too much, but can you tell us about what's that experience about? being on the first sort of Muslim superhero show and being able to play a Muslim and be a Muslim. What is, what does that authenticity mean to you? It is, uh, oh my gosh, 
I am just so ecstatic to be a part of this project. Yes, we have the first um, Muslim Pakistani American superhero um, leading their own series. And the thing that's really wonderful about Miss Marvel is that the, the, the culture, the heritage, the Muslimness, all of it is front and center. And I've never seen anything like this before. I, I believe the audience has never seen anything like this before. And so it's really exciting. And then on a personal level, to be able to play Taisha, who is a convert to Islam and uh, a woman who veils and she's like all of these things. She's like a nerd, uh, like she's a black girl nerd, which is really exciting to see um, in television because I feel like nerdism is often uh, limited to other groups, but there are a lot of black nerds. So that's exciting to see. And this woman who is very um, passionate and devout and just like she deeply loves, has a love for her family and her faith. And that's something she's very unapologetic in and how she carries herself, how she uh carries and practices her islam and goes in the world but she's also these other things she's funny she's witty she's intelligent and she's um a black woman and all of those things she's very unapologetic about and i'm excited for people to see that because i've never seen a character um on this level portrayed that way and i think it's very powerful and i feel extremely extremely honored to be the one to bring her to life and then also have that personal connection as a black Muslim woman and as a convert to understand her. So it, it's, it's fantastic. You know, I'm very protective of her and I just can't wait for people to meet her, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. Bilal, you've said that on sort of every character, regardless of their gender or sexuality is evolving, learning about themselves mm -hmm. and keeping secrets you are quoted as when we started to understand what we were going to watch, each of these characters navigate their own transition, their own relationship to that word, a lot of nuance started to come in. Can you tell me about that? Yeah, I, I, I think it, it was the, it helped us. Um, it was the key to unlocking the whole show. I think we initially just, you know, thought it was going to be a little bit of a riff on, on my actual life. I was a nanny for a little while, not not very good at it, and we thought that was kind of funny. <laughs> um, and, and, and then and then we started to look at well, then who's the father of that nanny family, and what does he represent? And mm. when we started to kind of really think about, of course, we knew there was going to be a brown mom on the show. I'm obsessed with my own mother and older South Asian women, and and so we just started to wonder, well, like she must be, go if her child starts to emerge in front of her, she's gonna go through a transition and the white nanny dad is gonna have to reckon with what it means to have an employee like Sebi, you know? And it, um, I think, I think um, I'm, I'm really grateful that we were able to start to apply that word to all the characters. Cause now when I get to talk about the show, I'm, I'm getting to use that word transition, which I think I, I think has a bit of a taboo stigma still around it. Like, oh no, it it, it only is applied to folks who are considering a medical surgical mm -hmm. kind of operation. But as as um as we were saying earlier, we were all born virgins. We're all like born changing <laughs> and evolving. You know, these aren't words mm -hmm. that need such um, stigma around them. Absolutely. Aiden, I've talked to you um, about, like, this is an enormous project. Like, these are like 10 episodes. Like, it's so complicated. You're creative, yet you're also a producer. And there are a lot of people watching you today and thinking to themselves, is it possible to do both and be like this all-encompassing entity? Can you talk to me about that? Yeah. Um, well, first and foremost, I am fangirling out to, uh, over everybody in this room. Every time you guys are talking, I'm like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Same. <laughs> Same. But to answer your question, um, for me, producing felt very natural. My background was in um, project management, and I work, came from the nonprofit sector doing project management. So I always knew that I could get anything done, anything I wanted to do. I could always reach it to the fullest completion. Um, and then my background was also as a visual artist. I I was really um, doing a lot of photography back in the day. And so with understanding that I, as an artist, I really want to have something look the way, look good, 
to my own standards and then also be completed as a project manager by my own standards. I always knew that I was going to be the, a producer on this project. Um, and then also another element is I watched a lot of like Oprah going up and, you know, you listen to all of these horror stories of people being taken advantage of and their, their idea or, or their business being stolen from them because they didn't know how to read the fine print. And with all of that in mind, I always knew I wanted to own my work. I wanted to do everything as much as possible to, to own my work so that I had the most leveraging power uh, down the line. And that's what, th those are the, the decisions. Um, that's, those are the thoughts that led to the, de the decision to go this way. I will say um, being the creative lead on this project and being a producer on the project, it, it is challenging. Um, it, it comes with its own set of challenges just because you know when I'm in a creative space, I can't think about the business and the logistics and it, it kind of is death to the creativity to think about logistics. Um, and then vice versa, when I'm in the other lens, then the creativity is kind of out the window unless it's a problem solving issue. So it really is a lot of right brain, left brain activity. And, you know, it, it would be nice to just kind of be a, an artist in full and only <laughs> at times. So sometimes I do miss that and I feel like I just want to be talent. Uh, <laughs> let someone else do all of the hard stuff. <laughs> 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 but but for me, it's worth it. I, for for me, especially at this stage, it's definitely worth it. And for anybody who's interested in thinking about whether or not they can do it, I would say try. It's taken many years for me to to get virgins off the ground, and we've had many like trial and errors, um, and lots of mistakes and lots of learnings. So just try and see if it's something that you know you'd like to do. Because there's nothing we can't do. We can all do anything we want. Jumping off of that, Bilal, can you talk to me about, like, you are also a producer on your series. What's it like, like, the responsibility of being a creative and also being responsible for the production parts of it? Like, how did you know that those were some of the roles you wanted to take on? I mean, the truth is, there were, I was terrified. I've been terrified. I, I'm like, you know, it's, it's a tall, tall order for... Like at my core, I'm deeply shy and I really like quiet and not being looked at. And I, rec I recognize the contradiction as I'm as I'm speaking. I, I, for me, it's the team that I work with. I like the, I work with an elder queer uh, BIPOC like producer on this show. Her name is Jennifer Quaja and and her team as along with my co-creator and and we it, there's a small group of us that make up it is the kind of like the little brain kind of behind the whole whole um machine and and i i feel so cared for by them and we we really check in with each other you know i'm gonna call jennifer later today you know and we it, you know it, it it's helping me feel like this work can be possible because it it is really difficult to sp the more intersectional you become the more the more intersectional you are that i think the work adds up you know there's emotional labor involved and kind of presenting yourself in ways to to make sure that people aren't off put or confused or whatever you know so i um i think for me i'm really grateful i couldn't do it on my own and i'm I'm, I don't want to. I I, I want to keep looking for like-minded thinkers and dreamers and like latch onto them and and make fun, cool shit, you know? Absolutely. Trevina, like speak of intersectionality, you're both a stand-up and you're a performer. And there's a lot of intersection between that. Why was that stand-up important to you? First of all, I also want to say that I love everything everyone is saying too. I'm like, uh um, I uh, I think stand up and comedy is always comedy is just something that's been very natural for me and who I am as a person. So I didn't really have a choice in the matter. I think I got peer pressured by a friend of mine, a Muslim friend of mine, to really like to go at it with improv and stand up. So uh, I think for that part, it's it's just something that I need to do. But I think comedy is just like this really beautiful vehicle that can be used to to um, educate people, to change people's hearts and their minds and to move the needle a little bit. You can like 
spoon feed people medicine through comedy, I think, which is <laughs> just wonderful. Like people won't even realize they'll be laughing and like, wait a minute, you know, like I learned something. Uh, I think like very famous sitcoms and, and TV shows have like brought different groups, marginalized groups into people's homes. And they're like, oh, okay, I guess gay people aren't so different because they're on Will and Grace or something like that. Um, or look, like what the Cosby show did for black families and, you know, Bill Cosby, we're not supposed to talk about him, but <laughs> the Cosby show was groundbreaking uh, in so many ways and helped for the black community, um, bring them into people's homes. And I think, it wouldn't happen without comedy. So I love the fact that I can use my stand up and my comedic storytelling in order to like get my story out there and also just open up parts of my And it's also not just doing it for people like as a black woman, as a Muslim, sometimes I put like talk about my Islam in my comedy, but it's not just like, uh, you know, white people that I'm trying to in educate or, or um, teach about. Like I've done stand-up shows and I have been approached by other Muslims. They're like, you're actually Muslim? <laughs> <laughs> okay, yes, really, but you're not practicing, are you? <laughs> or I've been asked, I did this interface show and, you know, this Jewish woman came up to me and was like, I was curious to see how this would work because I didn't know Muslims could laugh. <laughs> so yeah, and, and I think that's why it's important that we all do the work that we're doing, why we continue to create art, create art, tell authentic stories and use comedy to say that, yes, we're out here, we exist. And you know, we're, there's a spectrum of how we are in the world and what it means to be Muslim and a person of color and to be queer, all of these things. It's not a monolith. So representation us existing is what matters it's so important it does the work we're, we're doing it <laughs> we are I, mean, I wanted to jump off of that point um for you below like when i made little mosque on the prairie um i got a lot of backlash <laughs> you'd be surprised a lot of it and it wasn't even in my mind controversial at all like it was just yeah. you know very pat um but it was the first time muslims were seeing themselves and they were unhappy because they somehow in their minds they thought if every single Muslim isn't perfect and not making yep. mistakes, well, the U.S. is like imperfect and then there'll be even more, there'll be more hatred against us. Yeah. And it took years for them to kind of calm down and, and realize that you can show flawed Muslims with their mistakes and people will not hate you more. In fact, it will humanize us more. And like, I can't imagine like what, like what, how has, like, how have you felt, you know, with the Muslim reaction? Like what have you, you know, how's the community been reacting? Have you gotten any feedback? Like, I, you know, I, I, I've got to, after, when I get a little bit of a break, I want to like really um, seek out um, responses from um, older Muslim folks, from straight and cis Muslim folks, because they're, I'm, I'm, I'm not getting access to their feelings mm -hmm. experiencing this, this show. I'm, I'm hearing a lot from queer and trans Muslims, which, you know, is life-giving, right? Like, people talking about the way the show has kind of made things possible for their relationships with their parents and that, that you know, parents respecting children's pronouns, you know, through just watching the show and, or, or ex like breathing along with it, you know, but so all of that's great and, and, and lovely, seriously, but I, I, I don't know. I, I'm sure there's a conversation that is just not reaching me. And I'm, I'm curious. I'm curious. I don't know. No, it's it's interesting because it reaches you much later. And but yeah. sometimes sometimes it's better it doesn't reach you while you're making the thing because you have to put mm. these creative blinkers on. And because remember, my husband gave me this advice: like if you try to satisfy everyone, you will satisfy no one, and you'll mm. dilute your product. Yeah. And so you have to have a vision to kind of like do this and be tunnel. Otherwise, you get torn apart by all the criticism. Speaking of criticism, Aiden, how do you deal? How do you deal with it? Like you, I can't imagine like like you're coming at four different cultural groups and religions and um, gender identities. Like you must, you know, get people talking to you, going, "What are you doing? Like, how do you handle that?" Um, yeah, I've I've been really fortunate. So the whole process of like writing the show, making the show through and through, we always have folks of like from all representative of all our communities a part of the show so if there's any like 
you know, boo boo or <laughs> no, no, um, we're, we're, we're told like it's dealt with ahead of time. Also, I'm making this for young people. I know that there will be some folks who might feel like this is a little too provocative. Um, and that's, they're, they're allowed to have their feelings. Um, but the overall feedback I've gotten has been, there's a thirst and a hunger and an excitement for this. People are so excited for an East African virgins, you know? Um, and we grew up watching girlfriends and other folks grew up watching sex in the city. And there are so many iterations of girlfriend groups um, represented, but we just, we want one for ourselves too. And so I really, I really, um, I'm mentally prepared for when the show is released later on this year um, for any, you know, feedback, be positive or, or negative. It's, Fine. I think for me, the most important thing is um, questioning myself. Like, did I do my due diligence to tell the story respectfully? Did I, is there any harm that was actually put into this story? Is this realistic? I think that we need to hold ourselves accountable and I'm mm -hmm. happy to do so. And I put a lot of love and care into each character and each character's storyline. And I I feel really proud of of each of my girls, each of my characters and what is gonna what people are gonna see. So if people are unhappy with it, they're entitled to it and I am ready to hear what they what they have to say. It's a good answer. Trevina, when you think about your influences in entertainment and what has shaped you, what would you say? And below, I'm gonna ask you next. So you get to think, but not <laughs> who, who are your influences when it comes to performance, stand up, comedy, television? Like, who has informed like what you're thinking or doing? Like, are there are there places that you've drawn for strength or inspiration out there in the past or currently? A good question. Um, I coming to mind, I love like Maya Rudolph. I love everything that she does. I think she's so funny and so brilliant. Um, work, Ava DuVernay's work, stuff that Issa Rae is doing is really inspiring. Um, I think like the fact that she like great wrote, created like her own series and her own story about like young 20 somethings going through life and figuring things out and dating and being awkward. And it's another representation of like black women doing their thing in the world in a way that doesn't get seen. Her show is very groundbreaking in a lot of ways. So I'm very inspired by her and her work and watching her evolve as an, uh, an artist and a creator and all the things that have happened for her in her career. She's a boss. So I think she's a really big influence. Um, yeah, that's what I can think of right now on the spot. I'm like a comedy wise. Uh, I love so many people. I love like what Gerard Carmichael is doing. I I love, um, oh my goodness, why am I blanking? Oh, I love Ali Wong. She's so funny and so crass. I love it. Like <laughs> that imagery, you know what I'm saying? Like she's an Asian woman and she's like loud and funny and all of those things which counter so many stereotypes and expectations. So that, that's who I'm really digging right now off the top of my head and then I'll add somebody else if I, <laughs> I, I, I let you go first so Bilal had a chance to <laughs> but, <you're on. laughs> but did they <laughs> well honestly I was I I was like the, I was hearing you and I was like I still don't have an answer I still don't have an answer <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I care that I um I'm really right currently I'm really consuming um, uh, work that um, is like super quiet. I'm like really hungry for it. There, there's a bunch of these like indie films that feature like, you know, white women, young white women who are like searching for themselves and yeah. they're quiet kind of films and thinking about Julia Garner did The Assistant recently and some of Kristen Stewart's work kind of falls in this category. It's, it's like, I don't know how to define it, but it's just like sad searching white woman in a quiet... <laughs> 
movie with limited dialogue, you know, and <laughs> that's kind of giving me everything right now. And I, I want that version for myself, you know, like I think there's something fascinating anyways. Um, and, um, and then when I was thinking about comedy a little bit, I, I, I just love people who can kind of make me laugh one second and then cry the next. And, mm. and, and lately, Sa Sandra O oh does that a lot for me in, oh. in kind of her work always, but kind of especially in, in Killing Eve. There's, there, and, and then the chair she did recently too. Like she's, there's something really dynamic about, uh, she, she feels unpredictable to me, you know, as a, as a performer and that's like um, stunning. Aiden, since you've had more time than anyone, <laughs> are there influences that you draw on or people or like in the zeitgeist? What is? Yeah, Mindy Kaling is a hero to me. I'm obsessed with her. Um, also, Issa Rae. Um, I, Issa Rae was the blueprint. Like she, mm -hmm. <laughs> she she's the blueprint for how I even started uh, making the show. And I'm so grateful to her. Um, who else? Ava, Oprah. I, yeah, those, those are my, oh, and Shonda. Shonda is my mentor. She oh, doesn't yeah. know it. Obsessed yeah, with Shonda. Nice. Yeah. I know. First name basis. Yeah. I'm on first name basis with these ladies. <laughs> <laughs> a lot great. of questions, a lot of people that are watching the three of you, I think one of the biggest ones from a lot of young people is like, some of them don't know how to start. They're like, how does one even begin to get into this industry? And each one of you has had such a different story. I was going to start with you. Trevina, what would you say to a young person who's watching you going, I'm so inspired by you. I want to be you. How do I do that? Child, no, you don't. Um, <laughs> say. Um, I think, first of all, with that, like, um, I think it's important for people to be authentic to themselves and be themselves. I think the idea of seeing someone and trying to maybe mirror or come off of some of the, uh, the path that they've taken, some of the things they've done, but I think be who you are, lean into your values and how you show up in the world and that will pay off. I think just staying focused, being consistent but also being true to who you are in alignment with that. Because if it's being funny, then do that. If it's writing, then do that. If you want to tell stories and it's super sci-fi and like nerd out, do that thing. If that's what you want to do. And don't try to be someone else, but always yeah, be authentic to, you, to who you are because there are other people who will see themselves in you. Blah. I, 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 you know, I, I'm, I want to steal half of Trevina's answer and then just <laughs> yeah. add, like, just add, um, um, I, I spent a lot of time just like watching the world and developing opinions on, on things, you know, like participating in the world. I think, I think as artists, sometimes we can get caught up, especially when we're in the machine of it, which I find I was in theater before, you know, God bless theater. It's so like, um, you know, more patient and, and kind at times and I, you know I'm finding time management is so difficult for me now and and one of the things I'm trying to keep as a practice is to go to an art gallery and just let art wash over me and not be the person who has to create produce sell something you know or go for a walk or I know these are like super basic maybe I'm still in my white girl world of <laughs> But, but I, I just think it's about participating in the world and, and that actually informs the art versus, you know, spending all our time thinking about how do we get this onto paper, onto a, a computer screen? What if what if we lived in the world in the way that we could just kind of take things in? And, and, and when we're ready and when it feels like it's going to pour out, I think it just will, you know, and, and that's mm. been my experience with, with playwriting for sure, but it's kind of bleeding into the work I'm doing now too. And Aiden, you came from a background of photography? Yeah, my first art practice was photography, yeah. And how, can you just talk briefly how you morphed into a television and filmmaker? Um, yeah, uh, I had this idea for the show and I, at first I thought, okay, well, I'm a photographer, so I'm gonna do a photo series about this and then I thought more about it. I was planning it out and I realized, no, this is like movement. There needs to be like motion. So I 
realized, okay, I guess I'm making like a video installation. And then I realized, wait, there needs to be dialogue. And I was like, okay, so I guess I need to write a script. And it just really kind of happened like that all reluctantly. Like I did not want to learn how to write scripts. I did not want to be a filmmaker. That, that was never my intention or a dream that I had. Um, but I just believe that when you, when you have a like a vision for your art or an, as artists, you know, I feel like we're vessels for these ideas. And when they come to us, we just have to express it. And I don't believe that I'm a medium based artist. I believe in, I'm an artist and the art to, like picks its own medium. And this with virgins, the medium was film. And so I had to learn how to do that. And that's how I got into this. And luckily with photography, it gave me a lot of, um, it was a great basis to start with. I understood framing, color, uh, temperature, um, um, like making a shot list. There, there's a lot of um, transferable skills that come with it. Ph film is a lot more complicated than photography mm -hmm. for sure. It's like kindergarten to, I don't know, NASCAR. Like it's like, it's just different. Um, but that's that's kind of what the trajectory was. And it was looking at all of the mentors uh, that don't know me yet, but will uh, the Mindy Kalings and the Shonda Rhimes and reading their scripts of the my favorite episodes of theirs and their pilot episodes. Um, that's how I learned how to write a pilot by studying their pilots. Um, yeah, I, I just started. Excellent. I'm going to invite Faiza back to our conversation. Thanks everyone. This has been such a great conversation. Bilal used the word heart filling, which I think is completely the right word. It's obvious how inspirational it is. And it's really wonderful to hear all of you talking about your personal experiences. Uh, I am gonna break in just with a few questions from the audience, if that's okay. So the first question I think must be meant for Trevina, and it is what was the difference in being cast for Marvel versus other productions? Uh, I think the biggest difference with, between my work with other productions and Marvel is just the scale. Marvel's huge and um, it was everything was just so massive and that part was really exciting. And I'd say the other thing, the biggest thing, it may not be obvious to everyone is that Marvel's just so secretive. So usually when you get a project, you can kind of talk about it. You have ideas. But with this, I was like, what am I auditioning for? It's all <laughs> So secret. Um, like my reps didn't even see my audition tape. They have no idea what I look like. <laughs> so it it's been having to hold the secret for so long, I would say, is maybe the biggest difference that in other productions. And I can't wait for everyone to see it. June A. <laughs> Amazing. Well, so, yeah. I, I literally put it in my phone calendar today to make sure that I don't miss a moment. So and I'm trying Yay. not the only one. <laughs> Uh, and so now I have a question for Bilal and Aiden. So the question is, in the UK, we see a lot of Muslim characters played by non-Muslims. Why are Muslim roles, and so, so they're using the terminology of not cast authentically, um, but I, I guess essentially saying, you know, why is it that we can't fill these roles with Muslims? And so I don't know, maybe Bilal, if you want to start uh, just giving us your thoughts on that. Totally. Look, and you know, I, it's it's UK, it's US, it's Canada. Our show, uh, the mother is not a Muslim woman in in real life. My this person who plays my sister is not. You know, some some of the characters are the the uncle who comes in later in the season and and his kind of um, child. Or so I mean, for us, we it it, it it's we. It, I, I want to talk about the woman who plays the the mom. It's the the best way I feel like I can answer this question. I've known her for almost nine years in my life, and she was a part of my theater life. Played moms in in the plays that I that I wrote, and and it was a really kind of deep connection. And when sort of started to kind of material materialize, I I knew that it had to be her. Like. I, I wanted her. I, I, there was a connection that kind of transcended um, race and skin color and gender, and 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 it was about a, a feeling and a, and a heart kind of 
connection and and I I, th I don't know I don't know what's going on systemically I know when I was training as an actor I was the only Muslim in my class mm -hmm. you know there were other folks who were of color for sure but I was the brown Muslim one you know and I know that was happening in other theater schools too I mean I think maybe we can talk about I I have parents who aren't completely supportive or don't totally care still you know and and kind of haven't for a, a, a while and you know I think it's complicated and and I know my answer is kind of all over the place but I, I, I just speaking from from myself and from my truth I I was really searching for actors uh, we all were our team our producing team we were looking for actors who could really kind of bring their heart to the work and we auditioned lots of people and it ultimately yeah I don't know it just came down to like just the feeling what felt right, you know, and, and I, I know it's a difficult conversation because I do think that Muslims should be playing Muslims, but um, yeah, I know. I, I think it starts to, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I think that's, yeah, that's what I've got. That's really interesting. I, Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> I completely understand what you're saying, Bilal. I, what I noticed in the audition process for our show and not just even in the audition process, even when it came to crewing up and um, filling our writer's room, I wanted as much as possible to have all of our communities involved in every step of the process. And I think we did overall a pretty exceptional job. But that being said, it was so hard to find the people, to find the talent to fill these jobs. And I think... Well, I know in at least I'll, I'll speak about my own upbringing and my own community as an Ethiopian um, person that our families don't encourage us into the arts. They don't encourage us into performing, into, um, you know, being an, an electrician for um, a movie like they, they don't encourage you in, in these streams. And we often don't see people that look like us going into these streams as as um role models or examples of what is possible. And so in that way, when we were auditioning for folks, there are some, there's one person, there's one role who isn't uh, the, the same country person as the country they're representing. They're still of the, they're still like in and around adjacent communities, but, and they are Muslim. Uh, we made sure that Muslim people are being played by Muslim people, but it was so challenging to even find people to audition because the show is about sex, whether it's being had or not. And what is sex? What kind of sex? Like, what do we call sex? Um, and so it, it might sound, season one might sound like really um, tame because they're all virgins, but will they stay virgins in season two? Season three, like it's a journey, they're growing. And not everybody wants to be the face of sexual deviance because they come from culturally conservative communities. Um, so it, it's challenging. It, it has been challenging even as someone who is fighting for representation, authentic casting, which I, I hear this is what I'm hearing from you, Bilal, as well. When we're trying so hard and even we're having a hard time finding mm. folks, um, that's saying something. But I do believe that because we exist and we're here um, and we're creating opportunities and we're showing how um, caringly and with dignity we can represent and tell these stories, these very nuanced stories, that it will encourage folks to to come and try, <laughs> try to be an actor, a performer, a, a crew person, a writer. Um, yeah. That's great. Those are really helpful answers. And I think it speaks to a number of different themes, the different ways of understanding what it is to be othered or, or to identify with marginalization, but then also creating this pipeline of talent, right? When you've had a history of maybe misrepresentation or underrepresentation. Mm -hmm. So the next question is for everyone. Um, and it, uh, it, it's one that I think um, Zarka touched on a little bit, but uh, maybe a, a little bit more specific here. So the question is with respect, you are all strong, brave, and intelligent individuals, but I wonder what your bravery has cost you in personal terms with negative criticism. Mm -hmm. And so again, I know some of you touched on this a little bit previously, um, but maybe if, uh, if 
you haven't had a chance or if you want to expand on your answer. Maybe, Trevina, could I start with you? Um, sure. I, I think the only way to really get things done and to really be like as an artist, like we have to be brave. Bravery is like just a part of it. You can't be an artist and actually create things if you're not. Like the fact that we decided to make something and we wanted to show other people <laughs> what we made and make it for broader audiences. That's a form of bravery. Just up and moving my life to another um, part of the U.S. and away from my family. And I think it hasn't really cost me, I mean, I guess like deciding to join another religion, it might have like, you know, turned some people off and it might have cl closed some doors. Um, and I might have kept me from doing other things or maybe my career going in a different direction sooner. But I think I'm okay with that because I think the gain in the as, as opposed to the cost is that I get to be authentic and I get to live in my truth. And I get to have happiness and joy, and that's what's more important to me. And also, in the end, I'm getting to bring this really special character to life. And because I made these decisions and was open with my team about my Muslimness, and this is my identity, it wasn't something that I hid. Um, I think it also manifested and brought this opportunity to life for me. So I wouldn't really say that it's been too many, too many costs. Maybe financially, LA is expensive. Um, maybe we could have gone a different route and stayed in the South and had one of the babies and, and you know, going to TJ Maxx. I don't know. Maybe <laughs> not high gas prices. <laughs> <laughs> Single them? I don't know. That's, that's a, <laughs> those are costs for sure. But that is that is a really helpful answer. Bilal, did you have any comments on that? I mean, I, I, I just... I, I, visibility, I, I think it feels to me like a double-edged sword for sure. I, I think particularly in the, in the trans feminine world too, there's, it's too sad. It's, it's heartbreaking that so much of the conversation is often about what we look like and are we this enough or that enough or not this and not that. And um, I, I know that there, there's conversations like that out there. And I, um, you know, I, I think um, I'm really grateful that I, I, um, I love my therapist and I have a, I have a really healthy kind of outlook on my life and trying to balance things and really keeping my personal life quite special and, and intimate and full and, and then kind of doing the work stuff that I, that I need to. And, um, that's the way I'm, I'm kind of currently moving through it and, and it's working and it's possible. So I also want that kind of, um, rhetoric out there that we can be shy or in words and scared and and you know and and be critiqued for lots of things and still find it find find our way forward you know and i think it's just about strategizing and being like well who are the people who love me the most and how mm. often can i hold on to them and you know I, I, it kind of works i think that's great aiden would, did you want to add anything yeah uh i when it comes to criticism, I'm always open to correction. I'm happy to learn truly, and I'm happy to take accountability if, if for any missteps or wrongdoings. Um, I am incredibly thoughtful, though, with each step um, to try to mitigate those types of problems. But if you know we have blind sides, I'm open to being corrected. Beyond that, if it's not if it's not constructive to correct me, I don't care. If someone mm. is just wants to be critical and negative. You have your space in the universe to do that. You are welcome to do that. It doesn't penetrate my inner sphere. I, it, it, I don't care. I think it's really important as artists, um, like uh, Trevina said, we have to be brave by default. I did not get here by caring about what my community thinks about artists, whether or not being an artist would be a valuable um, path in my life. Everything I've done, I've had to put my own value of myself first and care about that first. And I think in having a healthy self-image and a healthy understanding of why you do what you do and that you are a good person, if I am meeting my own standards of that, then that is all that matters to me. Thank you so much. I love the way all three of you took a question about negative feedback 
and turned it into something so inspiring and positive. And really, I think that actually summarizes this panel today. Uh, but I think also the other the other events that we've had in this series, it has all been so inspiring. Uh, it's been great to see. We have lots of questions still from the audience. We don't have time, unfortunately. Uh, but I want to thank everyone so much for the questions. I want to thank all of the speakers. I'm so struck by the work that you've done and being the first often in your field, representing voices that are so often not heard or misunderstood, how much hard work you undertake in holding yourselves accountable and thinking about harm to others, which is not something all creators and all performers do. Uh, and I'm struck by the consistent theme that has run through all three of the symposium events that we've had of courage. Obviously, some of you are creating community and, and opportunities and support for other groundbreaking creative women, but or groundbreaking uh, creative uh, individuals, but you still had to take so many risks and just trust in the stories you have to tell. And I know that many others watching today and watching your work are inspired to these acts of courage as well. So thank you all so much for sharing your experiences in such a meaningful and authentic way. Uh, today's event was recorded and we will make that recording available on zarkanavaz.com. In the meantime, we do encourage our Canadian viewers to check out episodes of Zarka, free and available on CBC Gem. Uh, and for those of you who are interested in, in uh, other projects that, that our other speakers are working on, stay tuned and you will see trailers from all of the speakers as soon as the session concludes. But I just want once again to thank all of our participants, uh, the team working in the background, our sponsors, everyone who has taken the time to attend. It has been amazing to see these symposium events come together and we hope that the conversations are just getting started for all of us. Thank you all so much. Zarka. Zarka. So exotic. I sell white people, brown people things. Ka-ching. Zarkish delights. What kind of a person are you? I'm not a liar. I'm a schemer. I've got a plan. Your plans never work out. What's wrong with me? Oh, I've been waiting years for you to ask me that. He's getting remarried. Oh, my ex is making me even more crazy by marrying a white yoga instructor half his age in one week. Mama, what are you doing? I told everyone online I'm coming to the wedding with Brian. Who's Brian? You just made up a white brain surgeon named Brian, and then suddenly that exact person matched you on a dating site. I have so many ideas for our dates. Dates? There's something else going on here. Muslim, eh? What's that about? We haven't been introduced. <laughs> He's no one. <laughs> I'm her boyfriend. Now I know why white women don't bring guys home. You are old and have no guys to bring. I'm winning! Okay, so first off, I just want to say, I get it. You get what? High school. Kamala. Kamala. Another adventure shirt. Cute. She thinks I'm some kind of weirdo. You are a weirdo. Boys. Excuse me. Yeah. <laughs> you're kind of on my shirt. Sorry. But you're staring out the window in your little fantasy land. Kamala. Hey. Already? Really? Come on. Like. Do I have to figure out my whole future before lunch or is it like. Maybe they're right. I spend too much time in fantasy land. That is not to you. It's not really the brown girls from Jersey City who save the world. That's a fantasy too. Did something happen to you? You know why? Did you hear something? Come on, that. What does it feel like? Cosmic. I always thought I wanted this kind of life, but I never imagined any of this. Do you even know what you are? I'm a superhero. some questions. Are you in the right place in your life? 
In terms of... Are you using any of the skills you learned in electricity school? Hey. Electrician school? Are you happy living with your straight-ass sister? Get up, it's the middle of the day. Dating your homo-ish boyfriend? Oh shit, he's cheating on me. And he went back to women. What are you hoping will happen? They just keep being the way you are and everything's magically gonna change? I'm a nanny. Like Mary Poppins? Because they're about to, bitch. Move to Berlin with me, rent free. What? Who are you exactly? I'm here to take her home. Is this your nanny? You want to talk about yesterday, don't you? You're so real. I'm glad our kids have been exposed to you. I'm, I'm glad I exposed myself to them. Because we fired you? I wouldn't exactly call it a firing. Can you tell me what about working at Barbook specifically interests you? Your after hour dungeon nights? That's not us. Yeah, it is. Have you ever worked at a bar before? As a job? My gender studies prof is constantly imploring us to dismantle the binary. Totally. Do you know how to tap a keg? If you're a part-time nanny and a four times a week bartender, your life needs this. Berlin is like totally queer everlasting freedom. Hey, stranger. Everything in the galaxy is one thing becoming another thing. And Say that you are a stupid liar. I'm a stupid liar. We are all in transition. Pretend I'm your mom for a second. Seriously, role playing? Mother. I am not boying up for them. You kill it. There are consequences to our actions, Sebi. <laughs> Things are gonna get worse unless you seize every opportunity to be your fullest self. The people in your life who are going to love you, they're gonna love you anyway. You wear makeup and care for children. If you're not a girl, what are you? Today is the beginning of the rest of our lives. Queens, welcome to Manifestation Sunday. You are so extra. Girl, bye. Cheers. 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 This better work because I don't know how much longer Ash and I can put off getting engaged. Oh, the same man you can barely be seen in public with? have to do this every time. I want a man and a promotion at work. Just to start though, focus on the promotion, sis. Because you do not want to settle for a Toronto man. How's your day? It's good. Yeah? It's fun. Okay, awesome. Oh, here. Enjoy. Oh, it looks delicious. Thank you so much. Okay, so let me give you some tips on how to eat and... I know, I know. I've had Ethiopian before. A man. Actually, let's not do that. I'm asking the Manifestation Elves for an Oscar. I mean, your performance in Oh Her, She's Just a Friend was impeccable. Really? I thought, Pride, what's that? <laughs> With her best work yet. Wallahi, the quick change from her haram to halal outfit had me on the floor. Well, thanks for proving my point. Hand me those golden statues. Hey, well, lady. And what will you be manifesting, Miss Delina Ficka? Girl, I'm blessed. I just came from church. But I'll never say no to brunch. Ooh, looks like Jesus didn't tell you those student loans got paid today. Anyways, to new beginnings. Dickens. 